It's time for the Douglas Coleman Show. Mr. Smooth and Savvy is joined by guests from all walks of life. From the entertainment industry to authors to political and social commentators, the famous and not so famous, the controversial and the light and fluffy, we have it all. Now, here's Douglas Coleman. Hi there, uh, this is Roger Chapman. Uh, I'm a singer from the UK and have been for the last 50 odd years. Uh, I started my life with a band called Family. And you're listening to myself on the Douglas Coleman show. Uh, here's a song, it's the fourth track on the album, also I'm told. <laughs> it's called Rabbit Got the Gun, and it's from my latest album called Life in the Pond. Enjoy, everybody. These blues are made for walking on the streets Yet you wear it hurt, proud the power to believe It's a whole lot of hurt, having a whole lot of fun You got nowhere to hide, nowhere to run Ashes on the fire and the rabbit got a gun I slow the child in paradise Every rebel got a cause Even Jesus Christ There's a whole lot of hurt Having a whole lot of fun He had nowhere to hide Nowhere to run The house is on fire And the rabbit got a gun
Okay, please welcome to the Douglas Coleman Show, Roger Chapman. Hi, Roger. How are you? Uh, very well, thank you, Douglas, and very nice to speak to you today. Oh, well, thank you for coming on the show. I appreciate it. I'm looking at your bio, and uh, I think it's fair to call you a veteran in the music yeah, industry. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Yeah, I think so. Uh, hardly a newcomer. No, I think you've been around a while. And I, I'm always curious <laughs> when I've, I've had a few people on who have been in the business for a number of years, because you've seen the whole transition from how it was in the 60s with record albums mm -hmm. through cassettes through CDs and now digital download you've sort yeah. of gone through the whole thing and how do you feel about it how do you feel about all of the transformations in the music business do you think it was better then better now same different what is your take no on it? I mean I, I can't think that it's better I, I um I think the download thing kind of takes a, a little of the uh, imagery out of it, out of having a, a sleeve to look at or, you know, the 45 or the vinyl or, or even the cassette, something you hold in your hand. So I suppose there would only be that difference, if anything, you know. I mean, uh, people just download them and don't, I'm not sure that they see anything else ab about the song or the track or the or the actor, I think, or the, you know, the uh, the musician or the author, whatever. So I suppose just to have that that thing in your hands to me would be preferable. But there again, I'm not 16 to 26 and know nothing except download, you know. Well, I think it does sort of make the music, it sort of cheapens the music in a sense because... Yeah, it does. I yeah. think that a lot of artists who put in, and you know that you go into a studio and it takes a lot of time to put together yeah, your, yeah. your album. And then, you know, people are just sort of downloading your music or streaming your music. Uh, and it's akin to watching a full length feature movie on your phone screen, yeah. I think. You know, where it's like putting the tap on, isn't it? It's yeah, like, where you really it's just like turning the tap on, and the water pools out. <laughs> you really can't straight down the sink. Yeah, there just isn't that. I don't know. There isn't that sort of respect for it. Where people in the old yeah. days would buy would buy albums, and you'd take it home all excited and unwrap it and put it on the turntable, and you would sit there and listen to it for the forty minutes or whatever it was. I think yeah. I think also with that, there's almost a, a mute a mutual feeling between the artist and the person that's, you know, bought the album, whatever, you know, there's just a kind of mutual contact almost. Yeah. At least one side knows what the other one looks like, you know, that there's just invisible essence as it were, you know? Yeah, I agree. I, I think it's, it's taken some of the, the magic out of it. Yeah. 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 But mind you, they, they, they keep telling me that vinyl's making a big comeback, or it is over here, from what I can gather. So um, I don't really know. I know my album's up for a, a vinyl release, besides the CD, of course, but plus it's getting downloaded at the same time. Well, I think I, I like the idea that uh, a lot of people these days are offering all of it. You know, you can yeah. get it on vinyl, you can get it on CD, you get it on download. It's it's just more avenues for the musicians to make some money. Yes, of course. And yeah, yeah. Um, that's one thing that I'm sort of particular about with streaming is that I've always thought that it was kind of a rip off for the artist. A download, I don't mind, but it takes a hundred streams to get the same money as one download. Yeah. Well, yeah. that, now you know why the big business took it on. <laughs> exactly. They're always ready to rip off the artist ever since day one, you know. Yeah, that's not a so, new game. Uh, it, yeah. It, yeah, it's just uh, just another avenue where they can rip people off. Uh, I'm not saying everybody, but, well, let's just say 75% of them. <laughs> well, I, yeah, there's there's been countless stories about uh, management yeah. ripping off artists. That's not a new game. Certainly not. So... How have you been with COVID? Have you been all right? You avoided it? I've avoided it, I'm glad to say, yes. Uh, double jabbed and all that. And uh, and now we have, in the UK this past week, um, liberty to not have to wear masks when we go out. 
Oh, that's so uh, it's easing a little, although saying that after a year and a half, people are still walking about with the masks on anyway. I mean, people have got used to it and more scared of the options. They haven't, they haven't actually, they haven't, a lot of people haven't got, actually got used to the idea that it might be safe, me included, I have to say, um, because it's just been so so tricky over this past year and a half. Well, I think it's been tough for everybody. Has it affected your? Yeah, uh, of course. Yeah, have you? Have you? Um, were you performing prior to COVID? Uh, yes, I was prior to COVID. Uh, I would say a year up until a year last February, and I had some uh, for in come twenty uh, twenty twenty. Excuse me, I had some festivals and some dates booked in, but they all obviously got cancelled. I say obviously, but they did like most people did. Um, and I've been asked since, obviously with the new album, to do things. And and now, you know, my musicians, are, you know, we're basically around the same age anyway. With my band, the youngest are going to be in the 60s, you know. So, uh, and everybody's a little bit, a little bit nervous now. You know, and it's very difficult to get musicians to go out until it's real, until this problem is really nailed down. You know. Yeah, I don't know when that's coming because it, I think no, there's going to be a couple of waves of this. You know, before it really goes away. Yeah, well, I, I mean, it's, it's strange here because we, like I say, a week ago we had the, the all clear. Okay, masks are not now illegal, or it's not illegal not to wear a mask. I think I'm saying that right. Um, but then since then, we've had a surge of a new a new virus. Yeah, mutation. <laughs> um, they, yeah, oh. Although they say it's, it's under control, this, that, and the other, but I don't know, it's just, oh, it's just I don't know, it's like breathing into a cup, I don't know. Weird. Yeah, that's strange. Well, I hope it gets, gets gone soon, because... Yeah. Many of the guests that I have on this show are musicians, indie musicians, and I know they've been hurt really bad this past year because their bread and butter yeah. is performance. They course, don't, they yeah, don't make any music, money yeah. on, on recorded yeah. music anymore. So it's all live yeah. performance where they get their money. Yeah, yeah well, I mean, I, yeah, I've got good friends in the business itself. I mean, if they're not musicians and, gone, you know, like management companies gone seriously up the wall, you know. Yeah. And it's a shame to see because well, some of it, they're not all good, like the record companies, but you know, some of the good ones have gone as well, which is a real shame. I wanted it's hard to, to find good managers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, whatever happened to Peter Grant? Yeah, I thought he was a great manager. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, he he managed me for a while. Did he? Yeah. Yeah, in the sixties. Uh, or I should say, managed the band that was in that, which was a band called Family. Oh, uh, okay, quite, I didn't know. Quite, he, yeah, okay. Yeah, quite successful over here. I, I think uh, we were kind of whatever. Uh, who, who's it? I think that the Zeppelins kind of asked him to manage us, and because they really liked us anyway, the Zeps and all that. We come from the same school, really, same area of. Of the Britain, you know, England, oh, okay. and all that. So, uh, yeah. so we kind of got roped in there for a while while we while we failed our first American tour <laughs> 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 in a big way. Did you tour anyway. with Zeppelin? I mean, did you open for them at any point? Or? No, not at all. No, no, we were just pals, really, in the business. You know, and I say we most of us come from then from the Midlands, you know, Birmingham and Leicester, where we were from. The, um, the, well, like two or three of the Zeps were from Brum, Birmingham, excuse me. And so it's kind of, you know, you have that, uh, if all the guys are all coming from Liverpool, then they all seem to know each other. And if you come from the Midlands, which are the two towns I've just mentioned, then you kind of know each other anyway, you know. You're mm. working in each other's backyard all the time. So mm. we, kind of, you know, we kind of grew up together in the business. So how is Peter Grant as a manager? I mean, I I used him as an example just because he's so kind of known for being notoriously protective of the groups that he represented. Well, that's 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 what he's got. I mean, or that's what he had, and that really was the the best thing. You know, I mean, there aren't too many of them that, that will go the whole whack. I mean, unfortunately, we had a completely the opposite arsehole managing us, and. Thankfully, Peter Grant took up 
fifty percent of the manager when we went to the or went to the states or came away from the states. We, it did, I mean, it didn't last that long, but uh, but yes, he's the he's the epitome of the perfect manager. Uh, yes. For me, anyway, for most people, you know, just the way he looks after them boys, it's fantastic. Yeah. Well, not just them either. I mean, he really looked after Balls and um, oh shoot, sorry, I can't. Uh, what is the other big band? Uh, fantastic singer Rogers. Oh, Paul bad, Rogers. bad company. But bad, company. bad company. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he managed managed them, you know, and he looked after them just the same, you know. I mean, whoever was with him was with him, you know. Uh, yeah, good man, good man. Hard, but you got to be to put up with the arseholes in this business. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good man. Yeah. I wanted to ask you something about, on your Wikipedia uh, biography, it says, I'm just going to read it to you and maybe you can explain what they mean or what you think they might oh, mean. Okay, well, I know nothing about Wikipedia. Okay. So, uh, okay. But it's very short. It just says, here. it says, his idiosyncratic brand of showmanship when performing. Oh, do you do well, something odd on stage when you perform? Only, only, only what they think so. Because to me, I just get up and sing. Well, that's all I. That's all I've. That's all I've ever done. Just get up and sing. I mean, whatever it leads to me mentally or anything, I'm not really sure. But my whole object is to get up there and sing my ass off. Because I know I'm a good singer, and I like to prove the point that I'm a good singer. And I don't do things that might be detrimental to my vocal. Um, uh, I mean, it, it's almost saying like I've got an act, and I haven't got an act at all. I don't <laughs> act when I go on the stage. I, to be, I mean, I, you can always edit this, but I mean, I don't go up there just to fuck about. You know, I mean, I I get up to sing. You know, yeah. it, it, it takes a certain kind of vitamin A, vitamin C, vitamin D, to to push you forward. I've got a lot of energy. I've always had unbelievable amount of energy, besides being quite strung out naturally. So it kind of, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> I don't need to take too many drugs. I'm, I'm sort of, I've got my own version. <laughs> <laughs> well, who knows what they're talking about? I don't know. I... <laughs> Uh, I'm not the same as everybody else. I mean, I, I'm not interested about being like anybody else. I'm just interested in singing how I sing. And, and really, my whole interest is just to get the band off. The finest thing in the world for me is to be on, on stage and having a good gig. There is no better feeling for a live musician. There can't be. I mean, there may be some sexual equivalence, but I think that is the equivalent on stage for a musician. You're listening to Mr. Smooth and Savvy right here on The Douglas Coleman Show. We'll be right back after these commercial messages. DJC Music and DJC Productions are pleased to announce a brand new website. We have started a listing website for radio show hosts as well as potential show guests. This is a meeting site where hosts and guests can come together. Show hosts can list their show and types of guests they're interested in booking. Potential guests can list their talents, bio, accomplishments, or anything they feel makes them an interesting radio show guest. There are no recurrent payments, only a one-time $5 listing fee. Your listing will stay up until you decide to cancel. Previous guests of The Douglas Coleman Show are welcome to submit their guest listing free of charge. Go to radiohostsandguests.com. That's radiohostsandguests.com. Douglas Coleman's Don't Do a Podcast is a dryly humorous rant about Douglas's pet peeve, the unrelenting torrent of podcasts hitting the web on a constant basis. As technology has put podcasting within the reach of anyone, many wholly unqualified people have taken the plunge. This witty polemic tries to persuade them from broadcasting their drivel using Douglas's brand of sarcastic humor. Now on Amazon, only 99 cents. Are you an independent musician? 
How would you like to have your songs played on hundreds of radio stations just like the one you're listening to right now? Join MusicSubmit.com and we'll promote your music to radio stations and blogs in your genre. It's free to set up your account and we guarantee your music will be considered for airplay by radio stations worldwide. Why not sign up today? It's free. MusicSubmit.com. Radio promotion for indie musicians. Hey, hey, this is Ray Powers. Don't touch anything. You've got it right where you need it. Tuned in to the Douglas Coleman Show. You heard me. I wanted to ask you just a little bit briefly about uh, your influences and when you were growing up, and then we'll get to your latest album, Life in the Pond. Back in the day, how did the British kids get American records to listen to? Yeah, like I see on here, your influences were Little Richard and Ray Charles. And it's not like today where you can just download anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, in the, in the 50s, in the UK, there were, we had a lot of American bases, army bases, you know, I mean, from World War II, as it were, still. And a lot of American forces over here centered in various parts of the UK. And... Um, while you, you know, when you were gigging, if you were gigging in the 50s and the 60s too, you know, you'd possibly play at these American bases, do a gig on a Saturday night at American base. Uh, again, in the Midlands, there were quite a few of these. One was called Bruntingthorpe, which is basically a village, but then it had, you know, the, the Americans built a, an army base there. Um, I mean, I remember I did a gig there, um, Black Gene Vincent. I don't know if you know Gene Vincent. <laughs> I know Gene right Vincent, yeah. Well, yeah. well yeah. begin. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, he was a, I was a big fan of him because I used to have a very high voice like him um, and could reach all of, all the ranges he used to sing, so I used to do quite a few of his songs. People like him, Eddie Cochran, and uh, then a couple of years later, you'd, you'd have had Ray Charles, you know. Right. Um, Jerry Lee Lewis, all that kind of thing. I'm, I mean, that's the kind of music I first started seeing with groups when I was about 16, I think. So you could get the music through the American bases. They had the records. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you could get the, uh, well, 78s it would have been, really, wouldn't it? Yeah. You know, like the vinyl, but the same size as, a, as an album, uh, except it was a single. <laughs> <laughs> In the, <laughs> did did that make sense at all? Yeah, I got it. I, I, I understood <laughs> that. No, I was just curious because you know you didn't have twenty five different radio stations. You had what BBC One and uh, yeah, you know, and I don't know how much American R and B kind of music they were playing no. in those days. You know? Well, my first inkling, I think, of anything sort of R and B ish, as it were, or you know. I have to say that more than rock was, I think, I heard Fats Domino, so I, Blue Monday. So, I mean, I'm thinking that was probably about 55, 56, something like that. Mm, okay. Um, on, the, on the radio. And I thought, oh, that's different, I think. You know, I mean, it's obviously a very long time ago. But then when I was at school, we were all into Elvis, you know. Elvis, um, you know, his first single, Blimey. Ay, 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 ay. Uh, uh, Hound Dog? No, 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 the very first one. Oh, the sort of, I don't know. The, the, the bluesy one. That's all right, Little Mama. Um, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure. Yeah, 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 never mind. Anyway. But it was it was a huge hit or worldwide hit. We, we, we'd be seeing it at school, you know. So, I mean, that's, that's when be, I'd be about 14 or 15 then. So, I don't really know unless we, obviously, we must have heard it on the radio and stuff. Because I wouldn't have been buying, I wouldn't have been able to afford to have bought records at that age myself. Yet they were expensive, well, weren't they, back then? Yeah. Yeah, but I mean, you know, we didn't have a lot of money anyway. Um, again, there were a lot of poor folk in the UK after the uh, after the war, and people still scratching about trying to trying to buy stuff to eat. Never mind. Mm. I don't know. To be honest, Douglas, I, I just can't answer the question very well. I think All you did a good job. We, we, knew, we knew them. <laughs> but the other thing is, I suppose, we used to go to record shops. And again, you know, when 15, 16, 
and then pretend you, you, you I say you want to hear one because you want to buy a record, but then there'll be about four or five of you stuck in a booth listening to the late, latest single and say, oh, no, I don't like it. <laughs> I'm not going to buy it. But we'd only go in there just to listen to it, you know, as our way of hearing the, the latest sounds, you know. Yes, yeah, they had the uh, the listening booths back then. That's yeah, long, long yeah. gone. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> definitely. Um, let's talk about your new album, Life in the Pond. Now, this maybe the last time was 2012, and then this one's 2021, yeah. so it's been a while, yeah? Yeah, well, actually, the last one nobody ever mentioned was called Peaceology, which was about seven years ago, which was a sort of an updated version of uh, One More Time for Peace, which came out rather uh, probably six or seven years before that. But anyway, that's, that's nothing really. Yeah, let's talk about some life in the pond. <laughs> okay. Well, why don't you describe it? Just tell us what it's like. Well, okay. Well, I suppose what it is, it, it's almost me, me and my pal, Polly Palmer, who, you know, we produced it together in his, his studio, home studio, really. And we start. I, ha I have a song because I'm permanently writing songs anyway. It's just something that's in me, thankfully. And we were actually, we were doing a bit of work, live work together with, with family because found the band I talked about earlier reformed for about three years and we did some shows and festivals um, so Polly and I got back quite close again and I said uh, it, Polly actually lives in the Midlands in Worcestershire but he also has a flat down in Putney which is close to me in London and I said uh, I've got some new songs do you mind if I come over and um, demo them you know, around at your place because he's got his studio there so he says, come over, and we did the first one, which, which, which is actually the first track on the album. It's called uh, Dark Side of the Stairs. Uh, and we did it, and it worked out so nicely that uh, we said, well, let's carry on, you know, because I had lots of ideas and been writing. Well, I always write a lot, like I say. I had a lot of musical ideas, and I said, can I bring them over? And then we'll put the things together and just work the two of us in his studio, you know. So... Uh, it kind of went from there. It wasn't meant to be an album or anything. It was, the logic was just to put all these ideas down. Um, and it just came about that because, again, you know, I'm, I suppose, I don't know if it's my age, but you get, unfortunately, I get more interested in politics. <laughs> and it's a shame, really, because there's been such a shit show the last few uh, years. Oh, yes, it has. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, obviously, you know, these influence my writing because they're, they're emotional things. Right. And uh, I tend to work on emotion as, as I do on the stage. It's quite emotional one way or the other. High emotion, not, not sort of sad emotion, but more, more stress. <laughs> anyway, um, so, I mean, I was just naturally writing about what was going on. And, and then Polly, Paul's, Paul and myself, we've, we've almost got the same musical background. You know, we, we're both really, very much influenced by it. Americana music right from the 50s, you know. Yeah. Um, not much not for, much from the English side at all. English pop, as it were. Um, and, you know, things like New Orleans and New York and, you know, these various areas, I'll call them areas, uh, we were in, influenced, you know, by, by the music that came out of these places. We just started writing this stuff, was it? And then we kind of got, oh, let's do a little bit of this, like, Huey Piano Smith, you know, do a bit of this like, da da da, da you know, and a bit of this like. And then, of course, we've, we've become kind of cod jazzers as well during the last, you know, 40, 50 years. Oh, a bit of Miles would be really good, like, you know, <laughs> and, um, and stuff like this, you know, we just started adding these ideas and, and putting things in certain grooves from various jazzified R&B stuff and we kind of just i don't know we just sort of put these things together to make them sound natural hopefully and make them sound like the real thing you know different influences all if, if you have you have you heard the album uh no i else? haven't yet but i'm going to well when you uh, yeah well when you play the tracks you'll see we we kind of we're almost 
de- delving in almost, well, I won't say every American bag, but quite a lot. You know, the, the tracks vary quite a lot. The musical aspects uh, vary quite a lot from track to track. You know, and you'll hear the kind of the, the R&B, the little bit of New York, a little bit of Miami, a little bit of this, a little bit of that. That's kind of that's influenced us through the years. Okay. Um, that's about uh, lyrically. And again, you know, obviously, well, I wrote all the lyrics, and they're the things that have influenced me. They're they're the emotional aspects of things that I've lived in over the past two three years and I put down a script you know as as prose and then put them to music and so I mean, it's gone like that it's all, all very natural in a very strange way the lockdown probably uh, kind of had its good aspects about it uh, because if you can't go out you've got nothing else to do but, but write you know, stay and, home and write music and look around yeah, exactly. and look around you you know yeah, yeah. Um, it stopped as getting together we, we actually started it was it uh about december 19 <clears throat> when we first wrote and produced the first song and um, then we had got the lockdown from february 2020 so therefore polly who lived in worcester was only allowed to travel at certain times and because he had hospital appointments in london as it were something like that mm-hmm. so we would only meet every kind of every month or so every six weeks and that was quite difficult because people from different cities weren't allowed to talk to each or, you know, mingle together, this, that, the other. But you're allowed to have, every household was allowed to have one person in to make any maintenance that you needed doing in the house. For instance, if you, you know, if the, the cooker blew up, then you're allowed to get a gas man in or whatever it's called, a cooker man or oh, blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I became the maintenance man for Paul Studio. <laughs> <laughs> that was clever. Yeah. <laughs> no, we're, we're old enough to be a bit smart, you know. What I mean? <laughs> <laughs> We've learned a few bits down the fucking years. <laughs> so the album's called Life in the Pond. Uh, it's out now, yeah. right? It's come out, released? Yeah. Yes, mate. Well, it's been out about a month, I think. It's been out about a month. Okay. All right. Great. Yeah. How's it doing? Any uh, any feedback yet? Quite well. Quite well for me. <laughs> I mean, the record company have been fantastic. Rough, Rough Records, it's a German company. I know the, the, the governor of the place, uh, Thomas Ruff, as opposed to Rufus Thomas. But uh, there's a fancy in itself, isn't it? <laughs> but uh, he's a really nice man. I had lunch with him probably a couple of years ago, and he was interested in what I was doing. Um, and again, when Polly and I started putting these tracks down, we'd done about six or seven, and I said, I think we might have an album here, Paul. I'll, I'll get in touch with two or three companies and you know, see what happens. Um, and we got some good interest on it. I mean, I, have to, I do have people that are interested in me, I'm glad to say after 60 years, still interested in me. But anyway, Thomas came through, I suppose, was more excited about the project. And so we went with Thomas, and his company's doing a great job for me, I have to say. Oh, that's great. Well, Roger, we do have to wrap up this interview. Thanks so much for coming on. It was uh, really lovely speaking with you and uh, talking about music. Best of luck with the new album. I hope it does really well. And... uh, Continued success for more music in the future. Well, thank you very much. I mean, it's a real pleasure to talk to yourself, Douglas, and uh, I'm, I'm glad I could, you know. I'm very pleased that people are interested in music I'm making today. Uh, it's a real real honor, really, and thank you for wanting to do something for me. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Do not make- 